Thank you, Barbara. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm uh, just thrilled tonight to be able to talk to Emma. Um, I read her book when it first came out, so when Barbara called and asked if I wanted to do this interview, there was no hesitation. It's definitely, so far, my favorite book of this year. So far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I have so many questions for her, but I thought we should start by, um, I can't see the audience, but I was wondering, no, I'm not even going to bother asking, one of the best things about having um, uh, an interview or a, uh, an event some time after pub date is more of the audience will have read the book when you're on tour the first week. Um, oh, I'm, ge I'm getting a chance to see. Uh, so. I am assuming many of you have already read the book, but if you have, you will get a chance to be reminded of Emma's uh, luscious prose. Um, and for those of you who have not yet heard this, you're in for a real treat. So she's gonna start by reading a couple of pages. Um, so this is just from the very beginning of the book. It's the first two pages. Um, okay. I looked up because of the laughter and kept looking because of the girls. I noticed their hair first, long and uncombed, then their jewelry catching the sun. The three of them were far enough away that I saw only the periphery of their features, but it didn't matter. I knew they were different from everyone else in the park. Families milling in a vague line, waiting for sausages and burgers from the open grill. Women in checked blouses, scooting into their boyfriend's sides, kids tossing eucalyptus buttons at the feral-looking chickens that overran the strip. These long-haired girls seemed to glide above all that was happening around them, tragic and separate, like royalty in exile. I studied the girls with a shameless, blatant gape. It didn't seem possible that they might look over and notice me. My hamburger was forgotten in my lap, the breeze blowing in minnow stink from the river. It was an age when I'd immediately scan and rank other girls, keeping up a constant tally of how I fell short, and I saw right away that the black-haired one was the prettiest. I had expected this, even before I'd been able to make out their faces. There was a suggestion of otherworldliness hovering around her, a dirty smock dress barely covering her ass. She was flanked by a skinny redhead and an older girl, dressed with the same shabby afterthought, as if dredged from a lake, all their cheap rings like a second set of knuckles. They were messing with an uneasy threshold, prettiness and ugliness at the same time, and a ripple of awareness followed them through the park. Mothers glancing around for their children, moved by some feeling they couldn't name, women reaching for their boyfriend's hands, the sun spiked through the trees like always, the drowsy willows, the hot wind gusting over the picnic blankets. But the familiarity of the day was disturbed by the path the girls cut across the regular world, sleek and thoughtless as sharks breaching the water. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to come back to those couple of pages after having read the book because it's Packed. Everything that the book is about is already hidden in those two pages. It's really wonderful. So I wanted to start, um, I guess, at the beginning, and that would be um, how you got to this. When I was um, 21, I was absolutely sure that I would have my first novel published in my 20s. And you're 27? Mm. Right. And uh, it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen, in fact, till I was 49. So <laughs> over the years, I have convinced myself pretty well um, that the reason it didn't happen is because we need to grow up, we need to get wise, we need to have light life experience. You could have all kinds of writing chops, but uh, that doesn't make you a writer if you're too young. So how the hell do you... <laughs> <laughs> this book is so wise. It is so full of the kinds of um, observations and understandings, especially of young girls and of life, that I find very surprising for a 27-year-old. 
Um, and the writing is, there's no question about the real chops that you have. So did you come fully formed into <laughs> this? Did you always want to be a writer? How did you get here? Yeah, I think I always wanted to be a writer. I'm from a very big family. Um, as Barbara said, I'm one of seven children. So as a young kid, reading was a way to have a private space. You didn't have to share with six other people. You could have your own world. Um, so yeah, just naturally out of that, I always wanted to be, be a writer. And did you study writing through college and grad yeah, school? Yeah, I was actually an art major in college, oh. studio art. And I went to San Francisco Art Institute for a little while. Ah. Um, but yeah, I took a few writing classes, uh, but I always thought it would be more interesting to study something else. Just, just to have that sort of sideways viewpoint on art and writing. And you still, do you make art? I do, not, not as much. I don't do much of anything these days <laughs> except, except for go the on tour. Uh, but yeah, I think it was helpful because it's so many of the same aims. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, how do you make this private world visible to other people? Mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the things that I find so remarkable about your prose. You get exactly the right revealing detail that helps us see the world the way your character sees the world. Yeah, I was, Joan Didion, I feel, is such a good California mm. writer who's so good at picking that one illuminating detail, right. you know, and it's right. slightly adjacent to what you'd expect. Mm. And who, what, what are other influences over the years? Yeah, I mean, she, for sure, I think it was the first time I understood you could write about California and the mythology of California. Um, and you could do it through a very personal lens. You know, mm -hmm. she's writing about huge cultural moments, right. but, but really choosing these small uh, frames to look at them through. Hmm. Uh, and then Mary Gateskill is another yeah. writer who I just think is so good at talking about it, having a female body and, and friendship and love and sex in a way that's, that's really unexpected and, and fresh to me. Mm, wonderful. Bo love both those examples. Um, so where did the inspiration come for this book? And I'm curious about the research. Um, did you spend a ton of time doing research and then create your own story? This is not Manson's story. It's also a wonderful choice to tell the story of the girls and not the leader of this um, group or commune. Um, so I'm curious what led you to this material and how you made some of those choices. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it was a time period that I was very aware of growing up, especially in Northern California, as we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a place that's still so haunted by the 60s in a way. Um, so it was really the legacy I was dealing with growing up. Uh, and then, you know, so I read all about the Manson family, but also Jonestown, mm -hmm. another Northern California export. Right. Great job, Northern California. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I read so much about them in high school, and maybe that was around the age when I first realized that there were these young girls involved often. And I was thinking about who are the people around the perimeters of these groups, mm -hmm. um, and sort of what's the story they tell themselves now about what that meant. And uh, just thinking what's universal there about the way we think about our past, uh, the way we feel that life, you know, rides on these choices, or is it luck, you know, how, how does life turn out and why? Mm, um, right. And then also wanting to write about teenage girls in a way that, that wasn't overly simplified and that didn't yeah. turn them into objects or, yeah. you know, representative of some moral position. Right. In fact, it's um, Evie, as, do you pronounce it Evie? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Evie, who is the center of the story and is 14 years old, um, she, she is the perfect entree for this world because she is so vulnerable, she is so adrift. Um, talk a little bit about the choice of her as um, the person to who should tell this story. Yeah, um, I thought a lot about uh, what age to make her, and to me, 14, is such a particular moment when mm -hmm. you're really coming up against the adult world, and especially as a, for a young girl, I think it's that moment when you're first encountering, you know, um, your life as a sexual being, and and how does the world treat young women in that in that realm, which is can be very dispiriting. Um, and then, yeah, I I wanted her to be very vulnerable in ordinary ways. Also, she's not 
more vulnerable than any you know, ordinary girl. Uh, and that's something I was thinking about. I think we have this tendency, especially when you're thinking about something so extreme as, as this infamous crime, that the people involved must be marked in some way right. or that there must have been some sign early on that they were uh, you know, meant for this outcome. So I really wanted a character who, in many ways, is... Could be any of yeah, us. Right? It's very ordinary. Yeah, no, in fact, I think that's what... Um, seems so striking at first is her life it, it could be our lives um, and it doesn't we can't remove ourselves from the journey that she takes even as dark as it gets we were right there kind of in her shadow right yeah and it's a much different project I think than than trying to tell the book from the point of view of somebody who was really involved in the crimes or someone at the right. at the heart of the group and I think that's become almost a cliche at this point, like the, the charismatic male leader. I feel like that's normally where a story like this would be right. centered. Right. And for me, I'm, I'm really tired of that trope at this point right. uh, and really wanted to make that character wrestle a, a really secondary character. Only once, and it was a man, they were like, love the book, why not more about Russell? He's the interesting one. And I was like, oh, if only the title of the book had indicated that maybe it would not be about him. It's also so funny. I got a um, uh, post on Facebook today when I had posted that I was doing this. Somebody wrote, well, I love that book, but why didn't she tell the story about the trial? <laughs> it's not Charles Manson. <laughs> right. And it is not his story. It yeah. is so much, um, not just Evie's story, but the story of the girls. Right. So I'd love for um, you to talk about, you know, we, can, we, we hear a lot these days about the male gaze, especially these, this right. week. Oh, God. <laughs> God. Let's not talk about that <laughs> right now. But let's talk about um, the female gaze. And yeah. you start there in those first two right. pages. And so that's what I was really interested in is this act of looking, which I think really unifies the book in a way. It's so much about being seen and that desire to be seen, right. um, which kind of never leaves Evie, even in later right. life. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about what would the male gaze look like internalized. I feel Evie is a narrator who's really internalized that male gaze and almost sees the women around her like a man would. Um, mm -hmm. She's so used to this really surface level hierarchical um, judgment. So in a way, she's, she's a very harsh narrator. Right. Um, and that's partly why I wanted there to be this older version of her that's actually narrating the story. Mm -hmm. Because I feel to be in a teenager's brain for an entire novel is <laughs> slightly <Painful>. oppressive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I reread my high school diaries before I read. In uh, preparation for before, writing? Oh, yeah. that's great. And you know, How you painful always was think, that? you'll be like, oh, I was a really thoughtful teenager. I was really <laughs> smart. And then you read this diary and it's just an embarrassment. You, I was a monster, <laughs> really monstrous. Um, yeah, and, and so I think, you know, every feeling a teenager has is so extreme, and there's like a real purity in that, mm -hmm. how, how deeply they feel things and how idealistic almost they are about the world. Right. I think compromise for them is really an anathema, right. uh, and I think that's why adults can be so disappointing, because you see, you know, they're compromising. Why aren't they, you know, uh, sticking to these ideals? Mm -hmm. um, you know, d teenage, teenagers are all about black and white feelings, and... Uh, the adult world is very much about gray areas. Uh, so that's why I liked having an older narrator who could contextualize those immense feelings. Well, um, I want to get back to the friendship question in a second, but bringing up the adult narrator, I loved that choice. Did you know that right away, that you would start, that you, she would be a major presence? Yeah, I, that was actually my only entry way wow. into the book. I never was going to be a book just told from the point of view of a 14-year-old or this one summer. I think for me what was really interesting, and I think it came out of growing up in California at this time period when it is still dealing with this immense nostalgia for the 60s and like also trying to grapple with what it meant, is, is someone in the present day looking back and trying to make sense of it. And then also I, I really was interested in Evie the elder Evie as somebody who's in this very morally ambiguous position. Right. And sort of what are the ways this one summer has haunted her life? And, and, and with the young woman who was there in the right. house with her. Yeah. Right. And I think uh, there's, we have this narrative that you go through something difficult or traumatic and 
you emerge on the other side as a, a stronger person, having learned a lesson. And I really wanted to write a character who didn't learn anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, like, there's really no moral. Like, right. And uh, for me, that was, it's an interesting challenge I set for myself is how do you write a book that, that responds to how life feels often? Because I, I don't feel that life necessarily has that clear of a narrative or right. these clear morals and lessons. Um, so it's not a redemptive story right. in the yeah. end. And yeah, in many ways, she's stuck in this summer. Right. In fact, what I, one of the things that I like so much about the adult Evie looking back and in the current situation with the young couple in the house is that um, we get a chance to see uh, how, how was she affected by what happened, who is she now, and the expectation is, as you say, that she will be right. much improved and a fully formed, you know, uh, person in the world, and she is still adrift. Right. Uh, she's not quite um, found her way. So there's something so authentic about that to me. It doesn't feel, I don't feel like I'm being manipulated by a writer, which we so often feel. It feels much truer to the story that you're telling. Yeah. I like the ending to be ambiguous in the same way, too, that mm -hmm. there's no neat bow tied right. around anything. Right. In fact, speaking of the ending, um, at the very beginning of the novel, after that scene, and at the very end of the novel, there is a hint of danger from a man. So I'm assuming um, conscious choice on your part. Did that come right away? Did you find your way? Yeah, I always knew how I wanted the story to open um, with the, these strangers in the house who turn out to be benign. But that first immediate feeling of, of yeah. fear and horror, which I right. think for me is what, what was maybe the most the fizziest thing about the reading about the Manson murders when I was young is the sense that your home wasn't safe. Right. Um, and that's the way m my parents talked about it. Both of them grew up in California. And uh, they really talk about it as this moment when suddenly people started locking their doors. And it's also that Evie is not safe, right. even years later. Yeah. Um, and part of what makes her not safe is that she knows how close she came to, I don't, I don't want to give things away, <laughs> but to being, to be right. a part of that. Yeah, right? I think for her there's something really scary. And what I was thinking about in writing the book is that it's, it's so much more comforting to believe that the people who perpetrate these kinds of uh, murders or crimes, that they're, they're monsters who are much different right. than us. Right. And uh, to me what's actually a lot more frightening is, is that they're people who are familiar right. to us and that are recognizably human and vulnerable. Right. So that brings me back to the question of the female friendships. Um, Evie makes her way into, finds these girls, becomes a part of the group, attaches herself in particular to one of the girls, and they are not evil. Um, in some ways, in fact, they're protective at the same time as terribly dangerous. Right. Um, Talk a little bit about those choices. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really like the idea of writing a book, especially a coming-of-age story, uh, that focused on this other kind of love story. Right. I think traditionally it's, you know, no. a very, uh, you know, normalized uh, love story. And I, I think that dynamic between an older girl and a younger girl is so particularly interesting to me, too, right. because of uh, the way it involves idol worship and there's competition, but also real love. Right. Um, and a desire to be seen and right. protected. And I think in many ways, this relationship for Evie is the closest she ever gets to being truly seen, which I think is partly why later as an adult, she can't move beyond right. it. Right. It's kind of in many ways. What if this summer, when you were involved with this infamous, you know, crime, what if that was the best summer of your life? Right. Like, how do, how do you make sense of that right. later? That is, um, it's... It is definitely what I was thinking while I was reading those sections, and it's very unsettling, as, as it must be to her. Yeah. Yeah, you seem to have really crawled into her skin and have uh, gotten there in a very deep way. Yeah, I, I think I was also thinking about, um, you know, uh, like the Manson family or Jonestown even, all these people who, who circled around those groups but weren't involved in the, the major famous crime or whatever, or sort of what happens to them later. and. 
just from being interested in this stuff in, in high school, you see them popping up on message boards. Uh, in the, inter the internet is great for novelists and freaks everywhere. <laughs> but uh, they're, you know, it, it still seems really important to them. And obviously, it was this moment they're still struggling to make sense of, but also at the same time wanting to identify themselves with. Right. And that's really interesting to me is like, what's behind that desire to be known and, and to be seen still? Yeah. The, um, we were talking a little bit um, before we came out. I moved up to Sebastopol um, about a year and a half ago and from Silicon Valley. So it's a completely different world, as many of you probably know. Um, and in Sebastopol, it's as if um, the 60s are still going on. <laughs> there, there is not a great uh, distance between then and now. And while I was reading the novel, I was um, aware that there were not a ton of references, cultural references, the music that they were listening to, the books that they were reading, what yeah. was on TV. Did you do that purposely? I did, yeah. I think, I think the 60s is such a tricky time to write about because it's so familiar still in our consciousness. I think there's right. such mythic visual tropes that came out of the 60s, right. and we all have these immediate images that pop up in our minds when we think of the 60s. And I, I really wanted to avoid that and to, in many ways, you know, write a novel that maybe felt a little more universal, even though it's, it's pinned down to this one year. Um, and part of it was just thinking about how do you represent a 14-year-old's experience in 1969? What is she thinking about? And thinking about how do people experience their cultural moment? And I, my mom also kept a diary when she was 13 and 14, so around 1969. Did she let you read it? She did. <laughs> and uh, the day that man landed on the moon, all she wrote in her diary was, got a terrible haircut today. <laughs> <laughs> I got kissed that night. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so wonderful, and, and I really thought back to that entry so much in writing this book, because that's not how a 14-year-old girl is experiencing them. She's not, you know, thinking about the political movements. It's really, who are the people who are important to you? What's yeah. the immediate emotional drama of your yeah. life? It's great. It is, it, it truly does not feel... Um, that you, we are stuck in time, it feels like you're writing about now as well as then, and I, I so admire that. Oh, it's, not an, uh, <laughs> it's really not uh, very uh, easy to do that, especially when it's specifically tied to a crime that we all right. know about at, yeah. a, at a time. That's great. Um, I, your prose is, as I said before, I love the sort of um, exquisite details, the surprise of the details, that, that what we see is kind of always a little bit askew and what we learn from that. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your process. Is that what comes out in the first draft? Please don't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, how do you get there? And then do you have readers who help you? Do you go through many drafts? Yeah, I do go through. This book was maybe two or three years of working on it in various drafts. And what's so weird, and maybe this is your experience writing novels too, but like it's such a mess until the last week when it's not a mess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's really trying to remember how it became not a mess is so, you know, complicated when it's over. Um, but yeah, many drafts. Uh, my, one of my sisters who's here tonight, she's usually my first reader. Oh, uh, I feel like sisters you can really abuse <laughs> as readers. You can make them read so many more drafts than, <laughs> than a, a normal person would. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, for me, it's, it's a lot about finding an image with some torque or... Um, yeah, fizz. So language in the very first draft, well, you'll, you'll go for those images right away. Yeah, but and for me, the trickiest part is how do you link that back to a story with some forward right. momentum? And how much of the story do you know in advance? Yeah, with this, it really was not known. And then maybe the last summer I was working on, the last three months, that's when I really settled down with an outline. And that really helped um, bring it together. So you had already written a draft yeah. and then had to shape it in right. a different way. Interesting. And then what was the process like with your editor at Random House? Yeah, well, we were talking earlier. My editor is a really old school New York editor. Uh, she's the only person I've seen wearing a Chanel suit in real life. <laughs> it was a shock. <laughs> um, 
And uh, she writes very formal editorial letters. So they're many pages long and they sort of arrive at my apartment in Brooklyn. She had also never been to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so she came From to visit Manhattan. me one time. She's lived there her oh whole life. God. And uh, I could tell she put on her Brooklyn pantsuit. <laughs> She was in pants, so that's how I could tell. She, she knew she was headed to Brooklyn that day. Um, but yeah, she was wonderful. And yeah, we were saying earlier, you're so grateful for an editor. Yeah. It's like you don't have to do it alone. Right. I think that's right. why so many writers want to do TV and movies, because you're like, oh, you get to do it with a whole room full of people? <laughs> I'm, yeah, sign me up. I agree with you, but I, there are writers who don't want to be I, I edited to anthologies, and there are writers who don't want to, their prose to be touched. And yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you see it that oh, way. Oh, yeah, too. I'm grateful yeah. for it. Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit um, about the, um, we talk about the female gaze, the male gaze. You've got the world gaze right now. Uh, Emma just came back from a three-week uh, European tour. The book has been so successful and so uh, received so much attention. Um, what does that feel like? And can you write? Is that, does that feed your confidence and your sense of excitement about moving forward? Is it intimidating? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very alienating in a way to go from this, this deeply private experience where you have no sense of, of the life of the book beyond finishing it um, it's to this very public moment where, where you're putting something out in the world and kind of uh, have, having to deal with that part of it. And I think for me, it's, it's really about reminding myself why I, why I write, and it's not for those reasons, not for the public reasons, not for the noise. That part feels very unnatural to me. Right. Um, so yeah, and, and I think remembering that I would have written this book even if no one wanted to read it. Right. Uh, yeah, but it is funny having written a book so much about how we objectify women and then to go through the publishing process as right. a young woman. Right. You're just like, did you know? You didn't read the book. Well, <laughs> That's in fact, I noticed in some of the interviews a little too much attention on your hair or right, the color yeah. of your eyes. And uh, I'm not quite sure that a man would be no. <laughs> yeah. getting that kind of attention. Or like, what kind of clothes do you like to wear? You're right. like, right. human's clothes? Right. <laughs> Pants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and are you working on the next novel? I am, yeah. Good. What's weird about writing a book, as you know, too, is like you, you finish it and then there's a year, a year. of strange limbo mm -hmm. where you're like both anxious and then also wanting to work on something new. And the best thing in the world that you could do is to work on right. something new. Yeah, which is nice, I think, because that makes all this noise feel like noise, like it's not important. What's important is, is writing and getting back to that. Good, so we, I'm assuming you won't talk about that <laughs> yet. No, yeah, it's still early days, yeah. but good. it feels nice. And there's like one, if there's one good thing about doing the publicity stuff or the interviews, it's like, wow, writing is, is better than that at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it makes you wanna write. <laughs> Nothing else really does. <laughs> And it's kind of like the antidote is the poison, you know, you're like, yeah. oh no. <laughs> Do you have a writing schedule? Are you a very disciplined no, writer? No, I'm not. And I'm always so jealous when people are like, oh, I'm up with the sun, like I don my writing cloak, like I light eight <laughs> black candles. And you're like, ah. uh, no, I have no schedule, but I'd like one. Do you have one? <laughs> Can I steal it? <laughs> yeah. So it's just really when you feel yeah. the urge. And I think it's busy uh, this summer. The last couple of months have been right. book focused. Yeah, but it is weird because it's, you know, you finished this a while ago. It's like your kids home from boarding school. You're like, you again. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you reacquaint yourself. <laughs> I remember going on a book tour and forgetting the names of my characters. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Someone said, tell me about this character. And I was like, <laughs> who is it? What? Yeah, I had no recollection. I was like, anyway, the cover is really great, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do love the cover. <laughs> so I also had read that uh, Scott Rudin bought the movie rights. Will you be involved? Are you? No. No? Yeah, you, I think. Are you choosing not to be involved? Yeah, they asked if I wanted to write the script. And for me, yeah, I've spent a lot of time with these characters in the story. And I feel really invested Good. in a new project. Good. And 
Yeah. Good. I and think it's easy to get stuck in like the yeah, quicksand of I would imagine too. TV people. And is it happening? Do you know? Or? I don't know. Yeah, I try to keep as little, uh, I want to know as little as possible. Great. Oh, I think that's the better way to do <laughs> it, certainly. Um, one of the, um, the questions that I had in the book that I found um, haunted me was that, that how close Evie came to the darkest side of herself. Um, did you know as you were writing how far she would go? Yeah, I mean, I think I always knew that I, I wanted that morally ambiguous position, and I didn't want her to be fully involved, because that's a different story. Uh -huh. And I mean, an interesting one, but not my project. Did you know whether she would make the choice herself? I always knew that I kind of wanted someone else to make ah. it, because I think in a way that's, that's almost the worst, because yeah. you don't get that certainty. Right. There's not that sense of, oh, I know myself. It's like, oh, my life really yeah. rests on this moment of, of luck. Right. And, yeah. Which may have a lot to do with why she is adrift at the end of the night, right. later on yeah. in her life. And in a way, even jealous of Suzanne or right. the others, who get this very clear verdict and this very clear narrative, and the right. chance for redemption then because right. they've been announced as guilty. Was there any pressure from your publisher to give clearer answers, happy endings? Yeah, I think a few times they were like, there's a few too many pimples and scabs in this book, <laughs> <laughs> which fair enough, but uh, that was really the only thing they were trying to mm. you know, cheer up a little, maybe. So but they weren't concerned about the ambiguous... No, I think they understood that that was my main... Right. The, the thing I was most interested in circling around as, as a writer. That's pretty um, wonderful. Yeah, and I, I think I love that position of an outsider to the observer. That for me has always been such an interesting... I feel like The Great Gatsby is a good example of another mm -hmm. like, spooky observer. Right, um, Nick. And sort of in which ways are, are observers culpable. Terrific. That's yeah. great. Um, I read in one of the articles about you or interviews that um, because you grew up in such a large family, you always felt sort of an affinity to communal life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think uh, a commune is an exaggerated version of a family, always. <laughs> so in writing about a commune, you're just writing about this, a family, but just more amplified. Right. Um, but definitely, yeah, one of seven kids, as the other four in the audience can tell you. <laughs> it's like, it's so complicated, and there's so much jostling and power dynamics. It's really uh, uh, something, I think that's why I'm interested in writing about group dynamics. And so you take the Evie, who's about the loneliest girl <laughs> yeah. imaginable, uh, imaginable, and throw her in yeah. to that chaos that's much more familiar to, to you, too. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, less murder in my family than this <laughs> one, but so far. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think I will um, <laughs> we'll, um, open it up now to um, questions from the audience, if that... For Emma, just put up your hand and we will come to you. Don't be shy. There's one up there, Maggie. It's a really provocative book. I know I have questions, but we'll take one up there first. First question is right back here. I w I'm curious about a character whose name I don't remember, and hopefully you'll <laughs> I remember. Probably she don't doesn't either. either. <laughs> but it's the uh, young college student mm. from UC Berkeley who, I guess, she gets a ride from Berkeley up back up to the commune, and oh, right. um, who's the engineering student and kind of square and is a sort of the voice of morality. And he comes across as using, you know, fuzzy words like nice. But I thought it was, they were pretty powerful moments when he says, look around you, this place is a mess. Yeah. I mean, where did that come from? I was just curious about that. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's like you said, it's, it's a place for almost the reader to intervene. The reader sees what's happening, but Evie doesn't. And no one else in the book really does. And so by having an outsider enter, you get to sort of uh, illuminate the reality of the situation instead of this fantasy. Um, yeah, Tom, I remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Gold star. <laughs> and it happens at just the right moment um, because we as the reader are not quite sure how bad is it. Yeah. And then when we hear it at that point from his point of view, uh, we're ready for that other right. uh, voice of reason. Yeah, it's a reality check. Yeah. The next question's right here. Emma, to your left. Thanks. So uh, this might be kind of annoying, but what drives you to write? Like, what motivates you? It's not fame, it's not money. So what kind of, you know, you said you knew you wanted to be a writer at a really young age. Yeah. So what was it? Yeah. Um, man, I, that's another thing where it's like, I wish I had a really uh, inspiring answer, but it's almost like a compulsion. <laughs> um, or it's like, it's the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> I wish there were other things, but it, it's like a one-trick pony. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think what's, what's, what I've enjoyed about writing and, and what's brought me back to it is this uh, sense that you can kind of gather the, the moments of your life in some way mm -hmm. and create some kind of, of meaning out of them or that you can think about these questions maybe without ever coming to a satisfactory answer. But um, yeah, that the you get to think about, about almost the minutia of life in a way that, that otherwise would pass you by. Why do you write? Well, I was just um, trying <laughs> to remember whether it's a Joan Didion quote um, about we write to find out what we think, mm. what we know. Is it a Joan Didion quote? Um, yes, Joan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I l I, that's what I'm hearing in your answer, and I think that is very true, that um, life is messy and confusing and um, chaotic, and we can sit down in our own little bubbles and create these stories that help us find a path through yeah. all of it, make sense uh, of it. And I don't think we necessarily come to writing with answers. Right, exactly. Uh, we come to it with lots of questions, and that's what I see you doing in that book. Yeah, I feel like those are the books I'm drawn to as a reader, too, mm, right. are books that kind of ask questions that don't offer any right. kind of answer. Right, that's great. The next question is right here. Hi. Oh, thank you. Um, I loved the book. In fact, we were such nerds this summer. We <laughs> read it together on the beach. We each Aww. had a copy because we didn't want to <laughs> give it up. Um, but we spend a lot of time up in Petaluma. We mm. um, own a pet shop up there and live out in Tamales. And I loved you know, reading all about the town yeah. and really picturing it. And I thought it was really interesting that the beach town, which I'm guessing is Dillon Beach, but I don't know. I was curious why you never mentioned the name of it or really placed where that was, as opposed to really placing it in Petaluma and even the names of the roads yeah. that you had. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I was thinking of Dillon Beach for sure. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, I, it wasn't a, a purposeful thing. I, it might have even been that I don't like Dylan Beach as a name, just the way it sounds, but Petaluma I like. Uh, but yeah, I really like this, um, you know, because California, there's this image of it as this really sunny, you know, uh, paradise. And I think Northern California, beach towns especially, have that real darkness. Like, they're so beautiful, but there's a real darkness mm -hmm. there. Uh, you know, like the water is frigid and there are actual sharks swimming around in them and people get bit all the time. You're just like, oh my God. Um, and it's so damn cold. Yes. So I, I loved it as like this counterpoint to this hot, you know, sunny mm -hmm. summer is is this beach town where, where it's foggy and gray. Mm -hmm. Great. The next question's up here in the middle, Emma. Hi. Um, so I'm a Middlebury grad as well. Um, and I'm 27 and not nearly as accomplished as you. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I had a question just because I'm an editor, writer as well, and I wondered how much research went into this. Did you know you wanted to write about this subject in high school when, you were, when it piqued your interest, or did you hatch upon the idea later in life? How did you come to it? Yeah. Um, I... I was writing about groups in, in high school too, but I wasn't thinking about this moment. But I, I think I always knew I wanted to write about California, especially. Um, and uh, sort of these ex extreme heightened situations, which for me, a commune is kind of a, a heightened situation. And uh, the 60s feels like a, an extreme moment. Um, and then I, I think I always knew I wanted to write about girls, especially in girlhood. Uh, like I was saying before, I think, I especially as someone who was a young girl, 
uh, you read so many versions of, of girlhood or, or what it's supposed to look like, and it, it can feel very alienating and untrue. And, and just wanting to write about it in a way that allowed for kind of complex humanity mm -hmm. and, and girls who weren't just good girls or bad girls or, or sort of flat characters. Uh, and then we're, we're allowed to be ambivalent and nasty and... and complicated. Um, yeah. yeah. And did you know right away, once you sort of zeroed in on Charles Manson's story, um, did you know right away that you didn't want to use LA, but would yeah. choose. Yeah, I think uh, Northern California is so interesting to me. Um, I love it here. Yeah. <laughs> I really love it. Uh, I'm in New York now, but I really want to move home. Cause we I spent backstage <laughs> trying to talk her into moving back. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think it is, it's just such a particular ecosystem, and there are so many types of people here, and, and there's something about the landscape to me that, that really produces like an interesting uh, a character type, even. And LA doesn't interest me in the same way. I don't know it, I don't care about it for, for the reason. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and setting it in Northern California was just a way to, to sort of claim ownership over the story without right. feeling any responsibility to the facts mm -hmm. or the people who really get into the, the details of it. Um, and did you feel a need to move away from the Charles Manson story yeah. to make it your own yeah. and not a... I think because it's such a familiar story. Right. Um, not even in the U U.S., like I was on this European tour and everyone there knows Is that right? Manson. The worst question I got in Germany, they were like, who's worse, Charles Manson or Hitler? And I was like, I don't... I feel I don't want to answer this question. Um, <laughs> Trump, ha ha. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think when you're, when you're gonna, you know, it's like looking straight into the sun, like writing about Charles Manson. Like, we, mm -hmm. we all know that story, there's nothing fresh there or new. Um, and what I think I was interested in the story are like almost more archetypal things about it or symbolic things, like the mood and the atmosphere. Right. Um, and so what's, how can you write about it without, you know, if feeling a responsibility right. to it, it's only by, by renaming it and sort of reshaping yeah. it. And giving yourself that creative license yeah. to create something. Right, yeah, otherwise it's new. so oppressive. Right, right, so smart. The next question's up here in the back. Hi. Um, as Ellen intimated, I think there's, there's really impressive interpersonal wisdom in terms of sort of getting into the heads of the different characters and their motivations and their insights or lack of insights. And uh, so I'm just curious if you, you know, so ma particularly given your age, you know, so many people will look back at their teens or their 20s and think like, what was I thinking? You know, I was so clueless. And, and so I'm just curious, like, were you known among your friends and family all along for being like that? Do you think it came from being from a large family or? I think we should let her siblings answer yeah, that question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah uh, I definitely, I feel like uh, being, a, you know, writing about interpersonal things as a writer does not translate to like great interpersonal skills as just a human in the world, unfortunately. <laughs> Because um, I think it's much easier to see characters uh, as characters. Um, and I, I think their motivations are much clearer to you. Whereas in life, I feel you're almost always a mystery to yourself. Um, yeah, but that was really what interested me in writing the book is, is almost, instead of focusing on this one moment of a very obvious lurid violence, is thinking about almost the psychological violence and in everyday ways, sort of um, how our family relationships and romantic relationships and friendships sort of haunted by these violent acts uh, in much smaller, smaller versions. We even look at how her relationship with her father and it's a perfectly, I can't say normal relationship, but it does not seem dangerous. And then suddenly it seems dangerous. Yeah. Um, so you've shifted the balance so that every interpersonal relationship has the capacity to turn in that way. Right, yeah. I think I was thinking a lot about, you know, the surface of things, especially things we think of as, as safe, um, right. and, and sort of what's going on underneath. And for me, somehow the crime is like, it's a much more obvious metaphor for, for the kind of the, the rot under the surface of everyday life and, and domestic life especially. 
The next question's up here, up top to your left. Hi, I was thinking about um, when people ask you why you write, I was reminded that somebody asked the poet Lorca that once, and he said, well, I write because I want people to like me. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if people that liked you before like you differently now that you've created this marvelous book. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's kind of a good thing, I think, but s nothing has really changed. I think I had such a small group of friends before, so, so in many ways my life feels really exactly the same. Maybe people laugh at my jokes a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, but I don't go out that much, so I don't get, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, <laughs> I think. Uh, Which is pretty remarkable, given <laughs> how life-changing this experience can be. Yeah, I, th I think I just really tried to remind myself it almost has nothing to do with me. It runs parallel to me in the book, but never really intersects with, with the reality of, of who I am and what's actually important to me. And, th and that's been really nice to remember. And also, equally, that the the good and the bad things are, are unreal, you know. That's in also way. sort of crazy ass mature for <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. <laughs> the next question's right here in the middle. One of my, well, many of my favorite scenes in this book involved food. Because <laughs> when we first meet the girls, they're dumpster diving, they're, you know, getting all this rancid stuff, and then they're going back to the commune, and they're, you know, trying to make a meal out of all this, you know, ragtag, gross stuff. And then there were lots of scenes with food with, um, with Evie's mom. You know, when she, there's that really, I thought, very um, touching scene when she has the party, and it's a disaster, but what she, what she focuses on is the fact that her dessert failed. And so I was wondering if food, if there's something symbolic about food, or if it says something about the characters as they, as they enjoy it. Yeah, um, I got a really funny email, because like, it, it was from a book club, and they're like, yeah, normally we make like a themed meal for our, <laughs> our book club discussion. And they're like, your book? No, it's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> Blood sausage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think for me, it was Sorry. really, thinking about, you know, day-to-day -day life in a commune situation and how could I suck some of the romance out of it? Uh, because I was someone who totally romanticized um, communal living or, you know, these communes, especially I was thinking a lot of Olin Poly State Park in Nevada, which used to have a, a commune on it, um, I think called The Chosen Family. But, you know, you see these pictures and, and there's a real romance and nostalgia I can feel. Uh, for that moment, and then really trying to think, what would the days be like? Uh, what would the hygiene situation be like? What would the food actually be like? Um, so yeah, really using food almost as a way to, to foreground the, the reality of these things, which could be romanticized. Um, yeah, but no, no book club themed <laughs> meals, unfortunately. Next question here in the middle. Yeah. Um, oh. Hi, um, so I loved your book. Uh, feels really close. <laughs> um, no worries. So you mentioned kind of about your prose. So I kept underlining sentence after sentence in your book, and it was so beautifully written. Um, and you mentioned you kind of focus on an image when you're writing. Um, I'm just kind of curious, could you kind of go a bit more into that process? Because there's just so many like eloquent, really beautiful, beautiful sentences, and so I'm curious how you form those. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's uh, partly thinking of like, wh where does your brain immediately go when you are trying to communicate an image, and then thinking about what it is, what's next to it, what's off to the side, what's um, something maybe in the same family as the description you're trying to use, but not you know, that first initial response. Um, and then often, for me, it could be the way things sound, like a, a rhythm, um, which is funny. When I was in high school, I remember reading a Cormac McCarthy book, and I was very pretentious, just like circling everything. Oh, wow, so beautiful. And, uh, you know, he uses such crazy words, and you're just like, ah. Oh. And uh, he had this one line, and I underlined it, circle stars everywhere, wow, wow, wow. And I like found this book later, <laughs> you know, like a few years ago, and I was like, why did I underline <laughs> this? phrase. And I remember at the time, I was like, Silent Hills. Oh, that's beautiful. He's talking about silt. Like, oh, the black Silent Hills. And then I was like, silent. He just meant <laughs> Silent Hills. And it was such like a horrible moment where my pretentious teenage self was exposed. Uh, <laughs> 
And I feel like sometimes I'm still doing that where it's like something sounds so wonderful and then I have to actually, yeah. <laughs> My editor a few times was like, there's no such word. <laughs> but silent, I still think, I still think it's a good word and I, <laughs> I, I'm interested. <laughs> So even though um, your novel just uses the whole um, Manson history as a jumping off point, of course it is real and it is part of California history and there are women in prison and Charles Manson and curious, any reaction from them? Did they read the book? Have you ha heard from any of those folks? Yeah, no, no <laughs> contact, which is good, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. I think, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes okay. at a uh, signing, maybe, or something, uh, someone will come with a manila envelope, and I see them from the table, and I'm like, ooh, someone's bringing me some goodies. And usually inside is like some crazy press clipping or something. So I don't know if anyone has it. a manila envelope. <laughs> but, uh, so I want to remind you that Emma will be signing books in the atrium following tonight's program. Thanks to all of you so much for coming. Most of all, Emma Klein, Ellen Sussman, thank you so thank very you so much. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.